These are the stories of 10 of the greatest paintings in the world. I'm Andrew Marr. Art, not politics, is the great passion of my life. For me, it gets to the heart of what it is to be human. In galleries across the globe, there are great paintings, works made with almost supernatural skill, fierce passion, and extraordinary brain power. Now I want to tell stories behind some of the most iconic images in history, pictures like Leonardo's Mona Lisa, Van Gogh's Sunflowers, and Turner's Fighting Temeraire, paintings that represent the pinnacle of what people can do with paint and bristles. He created a brand new way of depicting the world. The colours would fizz and pop on the surface. It was like you could touch these people. It was like the portrait could speak to you. Behind every picture, there is a story. I'm going to peel back the layers to find out more about the lives of their creators and the worlds they came from. There was something about this middle-class Florentine housewife that intrigued him. Why are these the paintings we all know and love? How were they created? And what makes them the greatest paintings in the world? Success in the modern world of art is not found in the small details. It's measured by scale of ambition, by price at auction, and your media profile. In short, size matters. This is Tate Modern, the triumphant monster among contemporary art galleries. And with nearly six million visitors a year, it's in the top 10 most visited galleries and museums all around the world. So in a colossal space like this, it's entirely right that we find a hugely important painting by a giant of modern art whose fame is on an equally vast scale. When asked to name the world's most famous painter, more than 90% of us choose him. His paintings are so utterly distinctive that when you see this one whole, there is no question about who painted it. This could only be by one person, Pablo Picasso. It's his weeping woman painted in 1937, and nothing quite like it had ever been made before. Once seen, however briskly, never forgotten. This is one of the most unforgettable of the many remarkable images that Picasso made during an immense career that dominates the art world of the 20th century. For a picture so strong it almost jabs you in the eyes, it's really quite small, and the subject could hardly be simpler. A woman wearing a red hat is crying. She's holding a handkerchief, and she is so grief-stricken, she's more or less chewing it. It's deceptively simple, even cartoon-like. Her face has been shaped using thick black lines and painted using a striking combination of bright acid colors and much darker reds and blues. This is a woman in torment, racked with wrenching anguish. If you look at Picasso's treatment of her face, the tears are like little raindrops or jewels, and her face is marked in grief, almost as if she's been clawed by a tiger, those deep, deep gouges and scratches in blue on the face. You very rarely see visible teeth in portraits, and the teeth are there, again, emphasizing the ugliness, almost, of grief. Now, this is a very powerful image, but as a Picasso painting, it's not exactly unusual. He was a very prolific artist. It's said that every single day of his working life, Picasso made at least three things. And of those things, 10,000 or more were paintings. So what makes this, amongst those 10,000, quite so special? Well, this is an image painted at an important hinge in the artist's life when a horrific event in Spanish history arrived at a tumultuous moment in Picasso's complicated love life. 
to really understand this picture properly, we need to go back more than a hundred years to the story of the young Picasso, an arrogant, cocky young man determined to take the entire art world by storm. For an arrogant, cocky young man who wanted to make his name, there was only one destination. Even from the earliest years of his life in Spain, where he was born in 1881, the place that drew this prodigious talent like a magnet was Paris. Anyone that wanted to be a serious artist had to learn about art seriously, and that was happening in Paris. And all the galleries as well, the Louvre, Musée d'Orsay, beautiful Arc de Triomphe, People flock to Paris. And for a young man like Picasso, there were, let's say, other attractions when he finally arrived in 1900, aged all of 19. There were the bars, the brothels. It was fun, it was inspiring, and it was the place to be. There was this kind of bohemian mix which was going on in Paris. It attracts artists, they meet and socialize. But most importantly, they are debating the future of art. They are innovating together, they are taking risks. I think Picasso was there just exactly at the right time. The main influences during the early part of his time in Paris were stars of the previous generation, like Renoir and Toulouse-Lautrec. Like them, Picasso painted the world he saw around him in Montmartre, the beggars, bohemians, musicians and dance halls. But to get noticed, he had to show them in radically new ways. This is where Picasso learns to be an artist. It's a place where he can really flower, where he can really develop and, of course, experiment. And the outcome of these experiments are some of the most important and significant developments in modern art in the 20th century. One of the greatest of his breakthrough works was the almost ugly and still shocking The Ladies of Avignon, or Demoiselles d'Avignon. The Demoiselle d'Avignon was probably the most important painting of the first half of the 20th century. Picasso paints it in 1907. It's a brothel scene. It's drawn from his own memories of visiting a brothel in Barcelona when he was a young man living there. Picasso drew on his latest enthusiasm, African tribal art, and wrenched apart the rules of painting that had dominated Western art for centuries. But even that isn't what really unsettles the viewer. It's the blatant, unashamed animal directness of the brothel girls in their pain. Picasso has turned his back on the beauty and tenderness traditionally associated with nudes. And you're looking at them uh, sometimes from very multiple angles. So you can see a woman's buttocks and then they're twisted round and you can see her inner thigh. And you get this kind of very intimate but quite brutalised view, both of woman, uh, but also of humanity. We're looking at five women who do not sit there or stand there passively averting their gaze from the male viewer, but rather they return the gaze with this power, with this extraordinary confidence and sexuality. And this is what made the painting so disarming. Most who stood in front of it weren't sure where to look. Picasso's great rival Matisse first thought it was a bad joke. Matisse actually hated Les Demoiselles d'Avignon he said that Picasso would be found hanged behind the work because it was so bad. It shocked some of his other friends. And it wasn't shown for a long time because it was regarded as so revolutionary, so kind of brutal, so powerful. The small coterie of Picasso's friends and admirers seized on this innovation, this moment, and understood and appreciated that art could never be the same again. Everybody knows that something dramatic has changed and you have to paint your way through it or you have to reject it, but you have to face up to it. Nowadays, many people argue that that picture was the real beginning of modern painting. But there's an enormous gap between Les Demoiselles d'Avignon and the raw emotional power of Weeping Woman. And to pursue Picasso on that journey, we have to delve deeper into his tangled emotional life and also visit one of the darkest and grimmest episodes in modern Spanish history. Picasso's weeping woman nods to everything he's best known for. Unique methods, jolting colors, 
and of course the radical artistic style he personally invented. To understand the genius of this canvas, first, you need to understand Cubism. The great discovery or invention of Cubism, which Picasso and George Braque invented together just before the First World War, is that artists can see the world entirely differently. Instead of viewing it as a single flat plane in front of them from one perspective, you can bring different perspectives into the same picture. In this 1918 still life by Picasso, he paints a table on which are strewn a guitar, playing cards, a bottle, pieces of table, half-hidden shadows. They're fragmented and jumbled up across the canvas like a broken jigsaw. Breaking reality down in order to build it up again is central to the idea of cubism. You can, as it were, look around objects and behind them and emphasize their basic shapes. So you've got cylinders and globes and curves and lots of shadows. And by doing that, you see the world differently. Something as boring and banal as a bottle on a table or possibly a guitar suddenly looks interesting again for the very first time. Picasso revolutionized the way people looked at a canvas. It was a skill he would bring to all his most important works, and one which made him fabulously wealthy. By the 1920s, Picasso was an A-list celebrity. He was living his personal dream in a thrilling city, throbbing with excitement and opportunity. He just became richer and richer. He, he could do no wrong. The more he painted, the more ideas he had, and he had a lot of ideas, uh, the more his work sold. He became extremely wealthy very quickly. Picasso was at the peak of his powers, his confidence and productivity overflowing. But while he was driven by everything going on in his creative world, there was one place he looked for inspiration more than most. Picasso loved women. He loved them around. They made him feel good. As a man who was five foot four and not particularly handsome, women flocked at his feet. Why? Because the time that they were with him, he made them feel special. He has many love affairs. He's very charismatic. He's identified early on as a great, enormous talent. He's very seductive. And he has many relationships with women who become his muses the inspiration, a source of kind of rejuvenation to him. He referred to women as either goddesses or doormats and weeping machines. And it's extraordinary how they stayed with him and they fought over one another for his love. And he depicted them time and time again. Every important work in Picasso's collection, including The Weeping Woman, was inspired by one of his ever-changing cast of lovers. But there were some who meant much more than others. One with whom he had a very long relationship and a daughter was Marie-Thérèse Walter. Her and Picasso's grandson is Olivier. My grandfather, Pablo Picasso, met my grandmother, my future grandmother, Marie-Thérèse, in 1927, in January, in front of the Galleries Lafayette. She was in the shop, he was looking at her through the window, and um, he waited outside, and when she came out, he said, um, hello, mademoiselle, I am Picasso, and I would like uh, to make a portrait of you. So she was surprised, because she had no clue who Picasso was. But she, was, she said that he was a charming man with a beautiful red tie, and this is how um, the story started. Marie-Thérèse was 17 years old. She was a perfect model for Pablo. She was innocent, and uh, he was like a teacher. And step by step, she became totally uh, addicted to this beautiful little uh, love life. Marie-Thérèse was the latest in what was a rather long line of women whose character and looks inspired the by now world-famous Picasso to paint and draw furiously. But being his muse wasn't a poetic fate. Being Picasso's muse was not all it was cracked up to be. You might think, oh, be great, you're living the high life and you're in one of his beautiful villas and being taken out to bars and clubs. And... But it was a short-lived occupation. You had to be on call, hand and foot, 24-7. There may have been two of you on the go at the same time and you may not have known about the other one. 
And it was hard work. You, you would have to pose for him. Um, you would have to satisfy him. You would have to make sure that he was happy, that he was watered and fed. It was almost like looking after a child. Away from his studio on the Rue des Grandes Augustins and after nearly 10 contented and prolific years with Marie Thérèse, Picasso finally began to find that his creative motor was running on empty. He'd had two very, very difficult years where he'd almost decided to give up painting altogether and become a poet. And, in fact, he joked that on his tombstone he would like to have Pablo Picasso poet, one-time painter. But there was new inspiration on the horizon. In 1936, Picasso was at the Café Les Deux Magots, a chic and happening hotspot for Parisian intellectuals and artists, when he was introduced to a woman called Dora Maar, who would eventually be the model for Weeping Woman. He saw this sophisticated lady seated here. She was playing with a very pointed knife and uh, she was jabbing with the knife between her spread it uh, fingers and sometimes she was missing the target. So there was a lot of blood uh, on her hand and Pablo was fascinated. She was a photographer, she was an artist, she was a painter and uh, was far from the situation with Marie Therese, the sweet Marie Therese. The relationship became immediately like um, intense. His newest lover, a political artist herself, opened Picasso up to the dark truths about the age they were living through. He began to think afresh and to work afresh. And he needs something different. And certainly uh, in the 1930s, when he encounters Dora Maar, he really needed somebody who was dark, deep, a woman who was highly intelligent, creative. Dora Maar was really as much of an artist as Picasso was, but because she was a woman and it wasn't the hashtag me too time, she didn't have her chance. In these two portraits, we can see just how starkly their different characters impacted on his painting. In 1932's The Dreamer, Marie Therese is presented lying back in a post-coital reverie Curving, overtly sexual forms are rendered in colorful, lush, thick, soft pastel colors. She's a dance of sensual wobble. By contrast, Dora looks back at us in a more challenging way. She blazes with personality. At her ear, drinking from her mind is a bee, which some suggest may be Picasso himself. This same bee would reappear in Weeping Woman, feeding on a tear. Red fingernails, like that bloodied knife, match the challenging pout of her mouth, and she's all acidic colors and angularity, not cuddly, but incisive. So it's unsurprising that it's Dora who would now change the way that Picasso thought and painted. Picasso thought that she was extraordinary. She was gutsy, she was fiery. She was um, not afraid, um, and he found that very attractive. It was at the height of his affair with the more mature and challenging Dora, early in 1937, that Picasso was asked to paint something for the Paris International Exhibition, a huge art show opening that summer. He accepts the commission, and it's going to have to be pretty fast because it has to be finished by June. And the evolution of the painting is quite strange because Picasso has absolutely no idea for the first two or three months what he's going to do. Picasso struggles. He's he got this kind of block. It was Dora who got him out of his creative hole. In April 1937, she pushed a report about a wartime atrocity under his nose. It was the remark who brought Pablo's uh, newspaper showing that a village in Spain has been attacked by uh, German planes, uh, dropping bombs everywhere. I've seen the article in the newspaper, so the description was horrible. First pictures from the Basque Republic of the holy city of Guernica, scene of the most terrible air raid our modern history yet can boast. Hundreds were killed here, men, women, and children. 4,000 bombs were dropped out of a blue sky into a hell that raged unchecked for five murderous hours. 
Picasso's homeland was being torn apart by a bitter civil war pitching nationalists against Republicans. The nationalists were helped by the Nazi and Italian fascist forces who had decimated Guernica largely, it seems, out of mere curiosity to see what a large-scale air raid could do. The attack had no strategic purpose. They come in saturation bombing, sucking the oxygen out uh, and totally destroying the city. 70% of the city was destroyed and a third of the population was wiped out. The first time that there has been bombing of that scale in Europe, it's the catastrophe which alerts us to what modern warfare was going to look like. Reading about Guernica, Picasso was incensed, and he knew he'd found the subject for his Paris exhibition mural. He said and believed that art is the lie that told the truth, and he wanted the world to know. And Picasso was such a big, majestic superstar now in the art world that he felt that the only way to communicate the truth was through art, because art communicates better than any language, and and it breaks down language barriers. The work he painted furiously in just a few weeks, the precursor to his weeping woman, is called simply Guernica. It now hangs in Madrid's Reina Sofia, where more than four million people come to see it every single year. Manuel Borja Viel is the museum's director. He had many photographs of uh, bombings in, in Spain. Uh, we know that he was looking at the newsreels, we know he was looking at the uh, newspaper, and he's trying to understand this period and using media of the period, but through the tools of a painter. So that's why the painting is black and white, which is the color of the newsreels. This lack of color gives added impact to a canvas full of writhing, screaming, dying people and animals, rendered in flattened cubist caricature. He reacts with this painting to all these horrors. He reacts also to a new type of violence, the fact that the murder of a complete population could be done in a kind of administrative way. In 1937, Picasso's mother wrote to him from Barcelona. She described how smoke from the burning city was making her eyes water. And it was this image of a crying woman in a devastated city that then began to play on his mind. In this painting, that distraught woman is a hugely powerful figure. The real-life model for this and the weeping woman was Dora. As Picasso worked, Dora was constantly at his side, photographing his progress. She even added the flex on the horse's flank herself. We see that the tongue, that the scream of the woman could be like an arrow, an arrow against the bombs, an arrow against uh, the monstrosity, and also the breast. In many cases, they are like bombs, and the top of the breast is like the fuse of the bomb. So what he's telling us is that there is an element of resistance and an element that will be able, through uh, poetry, through the communality of the suffering, uh, overcome the barbarie of uh, the monstrosity of uh, the war. The bombing of Guernica and his relationship with Dora, a woman in so many ways his equal, changed everything for Picasso. Up to this point, his paintings had centered around planet Pablo. Now he was making a political statement. It packed a punch, but it did not land him much instant acclaim. When the painting was first uh, presented in 37, I mean, of course, there was a group of people that thought it was great, but many people didn't like it. Uh, for some uh, avant-garde artists, uh, this was too much of a billboard. This was too much of uh, a propaganda element. On the other hand, many people thought it was too abstract. So in a way, Guernica was caught between the people that thought it was too obvious and the people that thought it was too abstract. In time, this canvas would find a significant place in the world, but for now, Picasso was restless. 
Although his great anti-war masterpiece was now finished, Picasso was transfixed by the sufferings of the Spanish, and in particular, that idea of the tears running down the face of his own mother. That became, in his head, the simplest of images, a weeping, desolate woman. And this was the figure he now needed to immortalize. Pablo Picasso's Weeping Woman is a powerful image of the Spanish Civil War. Having completed and then exhibited his large-scale anti-war canvas, Guernica, he spent weeks obsessively painting and sketching the same tearful woman over and over again, a woman inspired by his mother and modelled on his lover, Dora Maar. This one, his final and widely considered his best, was completed in just a few days. When you get up close and personal with this picture, one of the things you notice very quickly is the thickness of the paint. Now, this is interesting because a lot of the time at this period, Picasso paints quite thinly. He puts great washes of colour, and the paint is really there to serve the drawing, not the other way around. This is different. At times, he's put on so much paint, it's almost on the edge of falling off the canvas. That is interesting, because it just shows how hard he was working on this picture. This is a picture he sweated over, and worked again, and reworked, and reworked, and reworked, until for him, it was absolutely perfect. And the sweaty intensity of that physical effort really amplifies his hugely bold choice of colours. What he's done is he's used all the warm, generous colours, the reds and the golds and the yellows and the oranges, but he's pushed them to the back of the picture plane. They're the wall behind the girl, they're the red carpet on which she's standing. Her own face is painted almost entirely in cold, cold colours, lots of white, lots of icy blue, lots of cold, acidic greens. So he's making the desolation vivid through the colours and the choice of colours. It has the raw urgency, not of an academic painting, but of a piece of graffiti in the New York underground. Brilliant graffiti, I grant you. Picasso is using cubist distortion, not to show off a new way of seeing or painting, but to show that he, as a modern painter, can represent human desolation and sorrow as emotionally and effectively as any of the great masters of the high Renaissance. This powerful image had a profound effect on an old and close friend of Picasso's, an artist and voracious collector of modern art, Roland Penrose, was visiting Pablo Picasso when he saw it in his studio. He was blown away by the painting's savagery and its power, and even though the paint was barely dry, he asked if he could buy it. Roland Penrose wanted it. He was desperate to have that painting. Uh, and I think it's a recognition, really, of the closeness of their friendship uh, that, uh, you know, that, that he allowed Roland to buy it from him. Picasso sold it to him for £284, £19,000 in today's money. In the back of Penrose's mind were the germs of an idea. He could send it out on a tour with Picasso's first anti-war masterpiece. He organised both Guernica and Weeping Woman, to go around and be shown as a way of highlighting the plight of the people of the Spanish Civil War. It was really an attempt to alert and raise money by touring this extraordinary work. First of all, it starts in London in the Burlington Galleries, uh, just off Bond Street. And it's not a huge success, but it is supported by people like Virginia Woolf and E.M. Forster, and who give subscriptions to showing it. And it visits other towns. I think it goes to Sheffield. And then it comes back to London, to the Whitechapel. And 15,000 people come to see the painting. Uh, it is opened by Clement Attlee, the leader of the opposition, the leader of the Labour Party, and subsequent prime minister. And it's a great rallying call for the working class in the East End to support the Republican cause in Spain. And apparently, the ticket price was a pair of boots to donate to soldiers and workers in Spain who are facing this fascist onslaught. Picasso's first political works had finally made their mark 580 miles from the atrocity they portrayed. 
When the now triumphant tour was over, Penrose took Weeping Woman back to the home he shared with his wife, the photographer Lee Miller, and their son, Anthony. He still has very strong memories of the man who painted it, his father's great friend, the now middle-aged Picasso. When Picasso came here in 1950, he immediately liked it. He felt very at home. He liked the animals on the farm. And he liked things like plum pudding and stuff like that that my mother gave him to eat, and scotch whiskey. He was very keen on that. At the time, Anthony was just a child. Well, I was instantly drawn to Picasso because he had this incredible warmth and friendliness and this capacity to really engage with me as a child. We invented a game. I was the bull and it was my job to put my horns on and charge across the room and try and knock Picasso over. But he was so quick on his feet that he'd jump out of the way at the last minute and I would go splat into the wall and I got fed up with going splat into the wall. So I thought of a different strategy. And I watched and waited. And when he wasn't looking, I crept up and I bit him. And he bit me right back. And in the moment before I started to yell, my mum heard him say, huh, that's the first Englishman I've ever bitten. Picasso's Weeping Woman also left its mark on the young Anthony. I guess I must have been about eight years old, and I asked my mum, why is the lady crying? And she said, the lady used to live in a town called Guernica. And one day, without any warning at all, airplanes came over and started dropping bombs, and they killed lots of people, and they set fire to the whole place, and they might have even killed her little boy. It gave me an enduring fascination with what was behind that painting. If you look at the woman's eyes, you can see what appear to be the silhouettes of airplanes. Now, she'd probably never, ever seen an airplane in her life before, and suddenly they were there, droning through the sky, and dropping bombs and killing everybody. That image would have been seared into her retina, if you like, forever. We can see that she is absolutely distraught. That anger, that pain, is what makes Weeping Woman so unforgettable. Now, there are people who think that great art should be like a warm bath, calm and reassuring, a kind of ointment for the pains of daily life. But it seems to me that if art is great, it ought to be able to represent all of human life. And that means the pain and the anger and the sorrow as well. An ointment? A warm bath, this is more like a barbed wire face mask. The Weeping Woman was an extraordinary painting to have on the walls of Penrose's London flat, and it had been part of their lives for more than 30 years when the next page turned in the remarkable story of this painting. Roland and his wife Lee were at home in their Sussex farmhouse in April 1969 when they got a phone call. It was my father's housekeeper from the apartment in London. And she was distraught. She was sobbing into the phone. The place had been broken into. The whole place had been trashed. The thieves had stolen absolutely the cream of the crop. There were several Picassos. There were, of course, some really important works. But the star of them all was the weeping woman. She had gone. My parents were absolutely devastated. They didn't have those paintings in their lives because of the monetary value. They had them there because of their importance as works of art and to have them taken away. It was like a bereavement. It was a really shattering loss. Picasso's great and troubling portrait had vanished, if not into thin air, then certainly into the grey London smog. By coincidence, the Metropolitan Police had just established a specialist art theft squad who are now on the case, and a reward worth nearly half a million pounds in today's money was offered. The investigation into the theft went on 
for quite a long time and not much happened. But then the police found an informer who pretended to be a go-between between between Roland and the thieves. And the police were tailing him when the thieves took him to where the paintings were hidden. It was in a shop in South London. Unknown to anybody, that day, a demolition team had moved in to tear down the shop and give it a makeover. So the thieves saw what was going on, and they just went straight on past, and the police were following them, went straight on past, and the whole thing came to nothing. It seemed as if this great painting about loss might itself be lost forever. Picasso's Weeping Woman is one of the artist's earliest and most powerful pieces of political propaganda. An image of a distraught woman which speaks to us as powerfully today as the year she was painted in response to a wartime atrocity. But in 1969, after more than 30 years as part of a private collection, hanging unseen in a London flat and, frankly, forgotten by the wider world, this extraordinary painting was stolen right off the wall. The Penrose family were terrified that Weeping Woman had disappeared forever. A major police sting operation had failed dismally, and unknown to all but the thieves, the paintings were hidden in a shop which was about to be gutted. Two of the workmen were tasked with clearing out all the junk, and they went into the basement and they pulled out the works, and one of them said, oh, it's all rubbish, burn it. And the other one, he thought, might be a Bobsworth in this. And so he took the Weeping Woman to an artist's materials shop. They saw that it was hand-painted in oils and it was signed Picasso, so they thought it might be important. And they called the police. And, of course, all hell broke loose in that moment. Stolen from under their noses and coming perilously close to being dumped in a bin, Weeping Woman was finally back, safe and sound. My father went to Chelsea Police Station, where they were all stacked up in, in a cell for safekeeping. And uh, he said, for the first time in his life, he wept for joy to see them all back and safe. The responsibility of owning such a painting could not have been made any clearer, and in 1987, Anthony's father gave Weeping Woman to the Tate, and she's been there ever since. She's meant to be out there telling people about the atrocity of war. For the first time in half a century, Picasso's masterpiece was on public display, People flock to see it and experience for themselves just how remarkable she is. It's very bold, it's very powerful, and of course, intensely sad. And I think you get almost the feeling of the emotion of her. The painting, I think, is universally moving, and that's Picasso's brilliance, that's his achievement. He's able to take the particularity of that story of these poor civilians bombed from the air, terrified, injured, suffering, and make this very personal private painting that speaks of kind of universal pain and grief, that eruption of sorrow that cannot be constrained. I think it embodied everything that people understood about that whole era and the tragedies that occurred, not just in the Spanish Civil War, but also in World War II. By the time Picasso died, on the 8th of April, 1973, he was the most influential artist of the 20th century. His Weeping Woman is a hugely important part of his legacy, but what about the woman who inspired the painting? Picasso's relationship with Dora Maar lasted until the 1940s, when he dumped her for his next muse. Dora had, uh, she had, I think, 
a nervous breakdown uh, after the relationship with Picasso finally collapsed. Picasso felt very guilty. She always said it wasn't because of him, but he felt guilty. He bought her a house, and she more or less lived on her own for the rest of her life. Weeping Woman is actually the best painting of Dora Maar because it showed her true soul. And I can imagine her weeping like that almost daily towards the end of her relationship and thereafter over Picasso. Of course, if you get too close to the sun, you get burned. And that was the tragedy in a sense of Dora. And of course, the power of his presence in the art world and the art scene would mean that she would be overshadowed for a huge amount of time. No longer. Ma is herself today celebrated as a very important artist, and her relationship with Picasso was about much more than its ending. Weeping Woman is testament to that. Weeping Woman is a tremendously important image because it's a universal image that we can all relate to. It's a picture that talks about suffering. And unfortunately, at one time or other, we are all used to suffering. I've known this painting for a long time, but I'd never realized before just how political it is. And I'm not just talking about the Spanish Civil War. I'm talking about relations between men and women. They say the personal is political, and that was certainly the case for Pablo Picasso. The Weeping Woman is as powerful today as she has ever been. There are plenty of paintings, perfectly well made, which somehow become limp and lifeless over time. And there are other paintings which radiate energy and become more alive and draw us in as time goes on. This picture crackles and fizzes with energy. It is impossible to be in the presence of the Weeping Woman and ignore her. And if you're looking for a definition of a great painting, that is about as clear as you can get. Next time, the final masterpiece of a truly iconic artist. People come into these rooms for that sense of serenity, and they walk out feeling calm and reassured about the world. This is the story of personal tragedy, he became so depressed that he stopped painting. Brutal violence. He could hear the fighting, he could hear the bombs. So many young soldiers were killed. An insatiable obsession behind Claude Monet's water lilies.